Now let's do that. But if definitions in use, definitions in use, we define a symbol in use not by saying that it is synonymous with some other symbol, definitions give you all sorts of synonyms, but by showing how the sentences in which it significantly occurs, that is meaningfully used, okay, can be translated into equivalent sentences, the logically equivalent, which contain neither the definiendum, the thing which is to be defined, nor any of the synonyms into which it would be defined. Now, a good illustration of this process is provided by Bertrand Russell's theory of definite descriptions, and I mentioned this without labeling it that way when we were talking about Russell. I used his example, the present king of France is bald, or I think I used this one as well, the, authorly, the author of Waverley is Scott, Sir Walter Scott. Here I notice Aya does not say the author of Waverley was Scott, but was Scotch. Scotch. Uh, well, Sir Walter Scott was Scotch. But his point is that the sentence, a sentence like that, the author of Waverley was Scotch, is equivalent to the following. And here's Russell's the theory of definite descriptions. That is to say, just how do you analyze a statement like the author of Waverley was Scotch? You want to analyze it into its logical constituents. One person and one person only wrote Waverley, and that person was Scotch. Now, you, you see, by opening up the logical meaning of the sentence, you now have statements that are more readily accessible to empirical verification or falsification. That's your point. By this exercise of logical analysis, uh, what you are doing is asking yourself, is this statement a factually, a factually meaningful statement, or is it not? You see. And uh, if it is, then you can refer it to um, whoever's appropriate business it is to determine its factuality, presumably to the literary critic. You see. It's not the business of the philosopher to ascertain truth, but only by careful logical analysis to determine who can ascertain truth. To ask, is it meaningful, empirically meaningful? Well, look again on page 64, and um, a further example that he gives at the bottom of that page, the new paragraph, he talks of the problem of giving an actual rule for translating sentences. Here's this business of logical analysis by finding a, logical equi a logically equivalent sentence, which is more amenable to empirical verification. The problem of translating sentences about a material body into sentences about sense data, ah, sense contents, which may be called the problem of the reduction of material things to sense contents. Now, this is the main philosophical part of the traditional problem of perception. Now, think about that for a moment. The problem of perception which is raised by Plato in the Republic and the Theaetetus about the reliability of sense perception in telling us about the real nature of physical things. The problem of perception is posed by Locke's representational theory and the correspondence between um, primary and secondary quality sensations on the one hand, material object on the other. Are primary qualities qualities of an object, as Locke thought, or are they purely subjective as Berkeley thought? Okay, and that's the kind of thing. And in the realist idealist debate of the 1910s and the 1920s, remember when we were talking about G.E. Moore, G.E. Moore was unclear about the relationship between sense data that we're directly aware of and the material object. Are the sense data the qualities of surface patches on a material object? Or are the sense qualities rather the simply uh, the subjective ideas which we ascribe to a material object? And it seems that the whole realist idealist debate, the realist phenomenalist debate of those days, hinged on the theory of sense data. We'll be coming back to that uh, later on. But he is saying that um, really the only philosophical significance to the thing is um, the question of whether logic, whether sense datum statements, are the logical equivalent of material object statements? Or is there some leftover in a material object statement that is not reducible to sense-statement statements? You see? Well, there's, there's one notion um, involved in a material object statement of uh, what you can call spatial occupancy. The space is taken. Is a spatial occupancy. Well, is that contained within sense-datum statements about color, and size, and shape, or not? And so you find that um, uh, one of the debates which grows out of the positivist approach is whether the reduction of material objects, physical objects, to sense datum statements can ever be complete. Okay. Now, there are some of the early positivists, like Schlick, Moritz Schlick, who said, yes, it can be. And so um, he's inclined to be a physicalist, in the sense that our knowledge of sense data is a knowledge of physical objects. But on the other hand, um, Ayer is not so sure. He's not so sure. Um, there seems to be some untranslatable ingredient in the language about material objects. Uh, so he comes out more as a phenomenalist. You see. Um, he does make reference at one point to the um, need to have ostensive statements. Ostensive statements are ones, empirical sense data statements, but they are ones which um, are so self-evident as to be absolutely certain. And he denies that there can be any such. Whereas some of the other logical positivists believe that there were ostensive statements, sense data statements are absolutely certain. After all, uh, you might suppose um, that um, a sense data statement about a color you observe is absolutely certain. But is it? Once you consider all the observation conditions that go into observing a color. Observation conditions about the light in which you're seeing things and so on and so forth. He does, um, later on, come down to the view, and he mentions this in that long introduction, uh, that there are certain uh, basic statements that we can appeal to uh, that are much more sure than many others. Basic statements. 
but still not the absolute certainty of the ostensive statements. Now, this business of um, analyzing material object statements in a sense data statements uh, illustrates what becomes um, for uh, many philosophical concerns a much larger issue. Because as the mind-body question came under discussion using these tools, the question was what was whether mental state statements are translatable without remainder into brain state statements. That is to say, whether you can adopt a physicalist interpretation of mind. Now, uh, this, um, after the taboo about metaphysics is lifted, becomes very significant. Because the attempt of the eliminative materialist, the materialist who wants to eliminate mind, is not only to eliminate a metaphysical entity called mind, but also to eliminate any language about mind. Because mental state language, he thinks, can be translatable without remainder in physical state language, including brain states. Whereas others will say there's one dimension that is lost in that. Mental state language is an I language, rather than an it language. And the self-referentiality of the I language of mental states is what is lost. Incidentally, if you've read any of the um, writings of Donald Mackay, um, M-C-K-A-Y, the uh, English brain scientist and philosopher, uh, also an evangelical, um, his books have been um, published by InterVarsity Press and circulated quite widely. Um, Donald Mackay, as a brain scientist, um, used this technique in criticizing purely materialistic interpretations of human nature, maintaining that uh, physical state language omits the I language, the I states, the mental state language. I remember talking with him one time. We were both of us speaking at conferences, two different conferences which happened to meet in the same facility. And so we gravitated to each other at um, dinner time for three nights running and had a three um, stages of philosophical dialogue accordingly, largely about this issue. And I was trying, I sat in on one of his presentations and was trying to suggest to him that uh, all he was doing was saying that um, uh, we can understand human nature if we use physical state, brain state language, and mental state language, but that's not saying anything about the nature of mind. That's just using empirical language, empirical data language. You're not doing anything to the mind-body problem. You're not saying anything about the existence of mind. To which he responded, eventually after we'd worked through this, that, and the other, well, how would I say it? What would I have to go on? All I've got is what the Bible says in empirical data. And the Bible doesn't say anything explicitly about the existence of a metaphysical entity called mind or soul. I said, well, what about a metaphysical assertion? Some metaphysical um, conceptualization? And he leaned back and said, metaphysical? And then the penny dropped. You mean you're operating with the empirical verifiability criteria? Yeah. He was a positivist. Uh, he, he wanted, as an empirical scientist, to stick with either empirical data or biblical data. Get it? And he was therefore stuck about handling metaphysical questions that are involved in certain Christian beliefs. Okay. He um, um, was a remarkable individual, and I think one of the real losses was that he died of cancer um, just a couple of years ago. Uh, a man who was still publishing doing some first-rate work. Donald McCarthy. You may have seen his book, The Clockwork Universe, things of that sort. All right. Um, now, where does he get this conception of analysis working for logical equivalency? Look at page 70, his concluding remark. Incidentally, look at the footnote on page 70, footnote 1. His ground for saying the philosopher is always concerned with an artificial language. That's the ideal language tradition. But um, the thing I want is the last lines there. It's to be remarked that the process of analyzing a language is facilitated if it's possible to use for the classification of its forms an artificial system of symbols whose structure is known. The best known example is the so-called system of logistics, symbolic logic, employed by Russell and Whitehead in Principia Mathematica. So you get a much more precise logical analysis of equivalences if you translate it into symbolic logic. Okay. Well, any questions there? Okay, chapter four. The chapter four, the a priori, and here take a look at page 75, page 75, where you notice um, the name of Mill is spattered over these pages, 74 and 75, because he's rejecting Mill's theory of the a priori which, as he points out at the top of 75, is that the propositions of logic and metaphysics, take it back, logic and mathematics, have the same status as empirical hypotheses. Remember Mill denied that there was any a priori at all, that laws of logic or empirical generalizations as are mathematical propositions. Okay. Um, now to that, um, he says, A.S.A. says, we maintain that they are independent of experience in the sense that they don't own their validity to empirical verification. We may come to discover them through an inductive process, but once we've apprehended them, we see that they're necessarily true. The best way to substantiate this, halfway down the page in the new paragraph, that the truths of logic and math are necessarily true is to examine cases. And he goes on to do so. And uh, the point that he is making is that these truths are necessary because, page 77, first paragraph, um, about six lines in, the principles of logic and mathematics are true universally simply because we never allow them to be anything else. And the reason for this is we cannot abandon them without contradicting ourselves. That's the old definition of a necessary truth, one who's contradictory or self-contradictory. We cannot abandon them without contradicting ourselves, without sinning against the rules that govern the use of language, making our utterances self stultifying In other words, the truths of logic and mathematics are analytic propositions or tautologies. And as tautologies, they're not true of anything, they're just useful tautologies that we employ every time we use language and um, they try to use words significantly rather than quicker. So uh, at the bottom of 78, he makes the point that if a proposition is analytic, 
when its validity depends solely on the definition of the symbols it contains. Definitions, you see. And synthetic when its validity is determined by the facts of experience. And so um, philosophy is concerned with definitions and what follows by definitions, follows from definitions. That is to say, from um, logic. And as a result, philosophy on page um, 80 and 81 is treated as simply an application of logic, an application of logic to language, the application of logic to language. Now, um, I think it's fair to say that those first four chapters um, are really concerned with the machinery, the mechanisms of logical positivism and what in terms of its methodology is distinctive. Chapters, and, and obviously that's a tremendously important thing to get a hold of. Chapters five and six begin to get into more substantive issues. Chapter five, talking of truth and probability, one main thing I want to stress here, it is that the question, what is truth? The problem of truth is really simply a problem of definition. A problem of definition in use. But when I say of a proposition that it's true, what do I mean? What's the logical equivalence? And you'll find that um, his argument is very simple, that when I say P is true, all I'm doing is asserting P. Um, it is true that the course is nearly ended. What does it is true that add? Doesn't add anything. So the assertion of truth is not itself a cognitive statement. I'm not asserting something in addition to the sentence. It is rather what gets to be called a performative utterance. A performative utterance is one that performs another function. You see. When the minister says at the end of the marriage ceremony, I now pronounce you man and wife, he's not informing you about something. What he's doing is performing a religious and civil function. You see. And so it's a performative utterance. Between um, two philosophers, P.F. Strawson and J.L. Austin, became known as the Strawson-Austin debate, in which Strawson took, took essentially Ayer's view that all truth assertions are performatives, and Austin said, no, you cannot translate <laughs> the statement that is true that without loss into simply a performative utterance. Or put it in another way, the statement, it is true that the course is nearly ended, is not the logical equivalent of the translation, the course is nearly ended. You see, the thing that is left out in the translation is the assertion that there is some extra-linguistic state of affairs to which the statement, the course has nearly ended, is referring. You see. It's a way of referring to an extra-linguistic, something beyond the language, an actual state of affairs. Austin is, in other words, asserting the correspondence definition of truth. Okay. So I got himself into hot water a bit on that one. Well, he goes on to point out that um, in matters of verification and falsification, all that's available is probability anyway. But it's chapter six, which is really the crux that um, you want to pay particular attention to. The critique of ethics and theology. All right, you know his procedure. What he's going to be doing is talking about the logical equivalent of ethical judgments. The logical equivalent of ethical judgments. And for that matter, aesthetic judgments as well. And in order to get at that, he distinguishes four kinds of ethical utterances. Look on page 103. And note carefully the four kinds. First, this is uh, six lines into the first complete paragraph on 103. First. Definitions of ethical terms. Okay. Right means what is just. Things of that sort. Now, you know what he thinks about definitions of ethical terms? That they're analytic. They're not true or false. They're simply a statement of how we're using language. Conventions. Second, propositions describing the phenomena of moral experience. I feel terrible about that. <laughs> 